Hey, welcome to Sports History Live. My name is Chris Black, and we're here with Phil Shane from VN Sports. We're going to keep talking about uh, Diego, Diego Maradona, uh, who just recently passed away, one of the greatest soccer players in all of us, in, 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 well, one of the greatest soccer players of all time. Phil, uh, what is your perspective on uh, life and career of Diego Maradona? It is so hard because when you talk about when you talk about legends, a lot of times they're so unidimensional, if you will. Uh, you could talk about sports. I mean, like Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, nowadays, you have LeBron and Tom Brady, and uh, in almost every single way, they're iconic with their sport. There are very few that cross boundaries. And I mean, when you think about that, maybe the likes of Muhammad Ali, uh, but Diego Maradona was definitely one of them. And uh, Dave Marcus just wrote a piece in the Federalist today talking about when he was growing up and he wasn't a soccer fan uh, until he saw Maradona in, in Mexico. And then he just fell in love with the sport because he saw how it was supposed to be played. And it just struck me when I was reading that and I wrote back to him and I just said he was just one of those players that even if you didn't like him, you loved him. And there are there are very few I mentioned Muhammad Ali. There's a lot of people who didn't like what he did uh, and the way he protested against the war. And in many ways, it blackballed him from the sport of boxing for a while. Uh, but when you look back at it in history, I don't think there's many that, that wouldn't say they loved who he was. And that was that character that might have been viewed as a negative was him. It, it was not fake. It was not put on. Uh, he was actually, I guess, putting his, his money where his mouth is. And Maradona was the same way, even though in growing up in South Florida and still living here now again, um, I know how volatile the pictures of him standing next to Fidel Castro were, the pictures of him with Hugo Chavez, et cetera. But again, maybe it's misplaced. Uh, if you listen to him talk, if you follow his life, if you, if you see his life, you can understand he has always been that kid from the other side of the tracks uh, that made it big. And he's always been the guy thumbing his nose at authority. Uh, and that was just part of his character. So you might disagree with the way he does things, but he was true to himself. Uh, and as far as his play on the field, probably one of the best ways I, I heard it described was this would have been three or four years ago when 442 was putting together a list of the greatest players of all time. And they said, sure, play score, scored more goals. Lionel Messi's won more trophies. But all you had to do to know how great Maradona was, was to watch the ball at his feet. And I think as great as Pelé was, as great as Messi was, for me, for a brief moment, it was the original Ronaldo before the injuries, uh, as far as the greatest player that I've ever seen. But uh, I think Maradona stands up to all of them and in many ways supersedes them. So it, it's just that whole package of what he was, where he was iconic. Can you describe the, uh, the his style of play? I know you're the, the attacking midfielder. How would he compare to today's players like uh, Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo? The closest would be Messi in his prime. I mean, maybe you do have a little bit of the De Bruyne's, et cetera, but um, he could make those passes but he was so much more comfortable with the ball at his feet and driving towards goal. Uh, and he was one of those players also that when he stopped and put his foot on the ball, the defender was beaten because there weren't many defenders who could start up again as quick as he could. So he just had total mastery of, of himself on the field um, and the ball, which is kind of ironic because he probably didn't have that mastery off of the field. Otherwise he might've been viewed uh, in an almost impossible uh, target to reach. So I, I think in some ways he was his own worst enemy uh, for what was going on off the field, but that was just part of his charm. And then on the field, it was just phenomenal. I, I, you mentioned Messi, you look at Ronaldinho, you look at uh, uh, Ronaldo, 
uh, both of them. Cristiano had that that pace, but but Maradona was like Jean Claude Kili slaloming through defenders as opposed to just blowing past them. Mm -hmm. uh, And, and I'm trying to remember if it was after a goal. I think it was. And something had happened, like maybe he'd been fouled. And uh, he was still arguing with the ref, but he, he wasn't winning the argument. So it's pretty much one of those things where he just said, okay, well, if that's the case, then I'm just going to take care of this myself. And he was kind of playing at half speed before, but at the kickoff, he just basically took the ball, dribbled through the entire defense, um, including Thomas Rangan twice. Uh, and, and then just put it in the back of the net. It was just that ability that George Best focused. Uh, there was no one that was going to stop him. And we saw that with England. Um, even the rules couldn't stop him. Uh, he, he found a way. And I know that the hand of God is the one that's always remembered, but um, you also end up taking a look at, at that phenomenal goal where he just dribbled through the English defense. And you could see uh, the coquettishness, the, the charm, and just the absolute mastery that he had, uh, it was just a, a complete package. We talk about his great play on the field. Now, his life uh, off the field was not so much of a, a uh, thing to, to really write all about that, the history and what, he, what he'd done. Talk about his uh, struggles off the field and how it can, how it impacted his play on the field and, and even as a manager uh, on, on, on the field. Well, from a manager perspective, um, soccer maybe is different than some, but I've always heard it described, and mainly through baseball, that if you were great as a player, you would be awful as a manager just because – you didn't have to work at it. It came naturally. And then when it comes time to describe to someone else who's not as gifted as you how to do it, it's impossible. As opposed to the guy who has to fight scratch and claw every year just to be the 24th guy on the, on the team, um, he knows all the tricks. He knows where you need to improve. He knows how to get that little extra. And that's why you end up having scrappers um, who turn into great baseball managers. Basketball can be a somewhat similar Although I, I think that maybe in this modern age, we see it with Zidane, we saw it with Pep Guardiola, where they're, especially when you're talking about big name superstars who are paid mega millions, why would they listen to the scrapper when all they have to do is just complain and he's going to be gone in a month's time? So in some ways, you look at the Zidans, you look at the Cruyffs, you look at the at the Guardiolas and the like, and they demand respect. And Maradona, I don't think he wanted to play that game. Um, he had his moments. We saw it in Mexican soccer uh, where he did the almost impossible. But then with his attention span as short as it was or distracted as it was, he just moved on to the next thing. And I, I think it was just one of those. He was looking for a challenge, but he didn't want to go through uh, the drudgery of that challenge. So if, if you just gave him a goal and gave him something even impossible to do, he'd try and do his best to do it. But then, uh, well, in some ways it was the same as a player. I mean, when you think about it, especially nowadays, something great happens around the world. It's on Twitter within 10 seconds um, and it's on YouTube forever. But even some of the greatest Lionel Messi goals or Cristiano Ronaldo goals or uh, however you want to talk about it, um, you'll end up seeing a, a hundred thousand, couple hundred thousand, maybe a million views for some of the greatest highlights. Maradona might be the only man I know who can get tens of millions of views for a video of him warming up. Um, and, and I don't know if you have to see the life is life video back in his Napoli days. And if I remember, it was like a European semifinal and everyone else is just following what the coach is saying and getting ready. And he's just standing at midfield, juggling the ball and dancing. Um, and there are tens of millions of people who have watched that video over and over again, maybe even just in the past week. 
Um, and I, I think that maybe epitomizes him more than anything because you have the complete skill and mastery of the ball, the complete disregard for authority. Um, but then when it comes time to actually go and, and get the job done, he was able to do that. So uh, difficult to manage in that regard. Then you get back to some of the situations with uh, with drugs, with alcohol, with women, with uh, uh, in trouble with the law, in trouble with the tax man. Um, it's just part of the package and it's not unique. Mention the fact there have been several boxers like Mike Tyson, maybe to a lesser extent, George Best. Uh, as I mentioned before, there have been uh, a number of burnouts, flameouts um, in whatever sport and whatever area of life there is. And it's not that success comes so easy for them, but it's that the time they have to express that success, to express what they're good at is so tiny a portion of their life. Um, soccer games are two hours time, once or twice a week. Maybe even in training, you have it throw in another couple hours a day. Uh, what are you gonna do the other 22 hours of the day? Especially when you have all that money, all that time and all that adoration. Uh, it's very, very easy. Uh, to get in trouble. And there's a lot more Maradonas in the world. Maybe they're not as noticeable or as good at it as he was in getting in trouble than there are the Wayne Gretzky's and Michael Jordan's who relatively keep their nose clean. So it's, it's just one of those situations where, and he was talking about, in fact, I, I, I just reminding me, I'm going to have to go take a look because he actually said that he wasn't, how would you say the worst choir boy? for lack of a better word, he was talking about El Salvador's Magico, uh, uh, Rodriguez and uh, El Magico Gonzalez and uh, similar story uh, with Celta Vigo. And they were pretty much the only team that would put up with all of that. But if you watch some of the moves that he had, there's just some of those players that just ha have been touched by God with a gift that when they don't have time to use that gift, they just get in trouble. Um, that is their focus and everything else falls and pales in comparison. Um, again, Lionel Messi is one of those ones where uh, he has been phenomenal. It, full credit to his parents, full credit to his wife, um, his upbringing, the people that are around him for the most part, uh, because of the way that they have guided him and the way that he's accepted that guidance. Even now that you sense he's on the downswing, um, we've been blessed to have the chance to watch him at his best for such a long period of time and probably still get a chance to see at least flashes of that next for the next four or five years or more. Um, and it wasn't exactly the case with Diego Maradona, but even then, because of who he was as a person and as a personality and the skills that he brought to the table, even when he was 35, 40, 50, uh, coming out to these uh, testimonial games, people would tune in just to watch Maradona, and uh, and more often than not, I mean, maybe there were memories of what used to be and would not be any longer, but there would be something that you would take away that was just distinctly Maradona. Um, so I guess the the long way around is it was a player who was in some ways gifted at what he did best and uh, tortured in some ways in the rest. When you look at his uh, play in the World Cup, uh, especially in, in the 94 Cup in the United States, uh, how, how he ended up getting kicked out of the tournament, uh, what does that say to his legacy when he gets kicked out of a tournament like the World Cup in the United States? Well, I, I think you almost have to look at it as uh, a trilogy and in some ways great story writing comes in threes uh, and he is homeric in many ways uh with his adventures where the first one well you could even go before i guess the uh the prelogue was when he wasn't called in for uh for th those earlier cups um even though he was good enough, he ended up going to the under-20s. It was phenomenal, although it also looked 
as though Argentina didn't really need him at that moment with the talent that they had at their disposal. But it just set the fire for him later when he was able to play. So 82 went by, 86 comes, and he was absolutely phenomenal uh, on a very good team. And then several of those players age out. Some other players step in, and they weren't quite that caliber. Um, some other players may be unavailable. And in 1990, wasn't a, a team bereft of talent, but it was maybe one bereft of, of guidance and determination. And almost single-handedly, he dragged Argentina to the final and almost won the tournament for him single-handedly. Uh, so you end up having this young phenom who bursts onto the scene, wins a World Cup trophy, in his prime, almost does it again single-handedly, only to be denied. Uh, I guess the boulder rolled back down. Um, and then in 94, kind of called out of virtual retirement to get in shape. And if you watched him play uh, in some of the club games, some of the national team games leading up to US 94, you could see flashes, you could see similarities. And he actually did through the Canisius, et cetera, the world actually have some players that he could play with. However, it was again, the lifestyle, maybe you could even say the genes, the inability to keep the weight off um, where, and again, you, you think about it, of all the drugs Maradona probably took in his life, it was pretty, it was a weight loss drug that kind of got him in trouble uh, where he was trying to just stay at his best. And the sad thing is, not saying that if he hadn't gotten caught, but the way that he was playing, the way that Argentina was playing with him, I could see them easily have having won USA 94. Um, and it would have been a much more thrilling encounter in the final than what we saw from Brazil and Italy. Nothing against uh, the likes of Otomario, Bebeto, and, uh, and Baggio, but Maradona and that Argentine team, it was different than 90 where he had to drag them. This time he was more almost the fulcrum and uh, the soul of this Argentina team. But when he went out, they were crushed and, and they went out as well. So it's a little different than the way we saw Zidane's World Cup end, where it was a flash of red uh, and... Both of them are sad ways to exit. Uh, I, as far as a Maradona goes, of all of the things that he's gotten in trouble for, that was probably one of the tamest. But from a World Cup memory, you're right. It, it was the last. What is your biggest memory of watching Maradona play? That's a tough one just because there's so many. And I'd have to say it would be that game against England uh, from a playing perspective where you had the good, the bad, and the ugly all in one. And again, with the, the hand of God, um, which again, somewhat iconically was uh, epitomized in a cartoon this past week where it shows him Diego Maradona coming up to heaven and handing God's hand back to him and saying, thanks uh, again, just as only Maradona could be uh, involved in that. But then you also took a look at what he did with the ball at his feet and the English defenders at his feet as well. Um, there, I don't know if there has been a player and, and we've seen Lionel Messi make similar moves. And in fact, it's almost seems like every superstar since Maradona has to find a way to score a goal with their hand. We saw it with Messi, we've seen it with the ball, et cetera, uh, where it's just one of those little situations of, of getting one over on the referee, um, part of a rite of passage. Uh, and we've seen Messi, was it Etafe a few years back um, where he dribbled through a team, but that wasn't in a world cup uh, against one of the best teams on earth. So uh, I'd say that, but probably the one again is just that warm up for Napoli because it, it doesn't even count as a game. It's not going to show up in a history book really anywhere. 
It doesn't really mean or signify anything, but it perfectly captures the joy that he felt when the ball was at his feet and the joy that he spread when the ball was at his feet. And again, if you haven't had the chance to see it, Life is Life is the, is the song, which was a, a big nightclub song, top pop song back in the day. Um, and just watching him for a couple of minutes, everyone else is working around him and he's just in his own little universe with the ball. And again, that joy is probably what I'm gonna remember the most. Uh, as I said, I well, when I was growing up, I was not an Argentine fan. I was not a Boca fan. I was not a Napoli fan. Um, back when I was growing up in those days, I, I was—I don't know if, if others are like this, but I kind of had my favorite team from every every country that I could follow. And and for me, it was River and Maradona was a nemesis. For me, it was Milan and Napoli ended the Milan run. Uh, for me, it was probably at least in South American soccer. Uh, Growing up watching Nene Cubillas, um, I loved Peru. I loved watching those Brazilian teams. Maradona was always the guy in the black hat, but every story needs the guy in the black hat. And even though I was almost always rooting against him, at the same moment, I was almost always waiting for him to work his magic. He, is, he was a human highlight on and off the field. And like I said at the beginning, even if you didn't like him, you loved him. Well, that's Phil Chain from BN Sports. Thanks a lot, Bill. My pleasure, Chris.